So the goodness of God in suffering is what we want to talk about for a few minutes. So um, we don't need to go straight to our experiences, but I'm sure that should be a part of it. Sure. Um, how have you discovered God to be good to you in measures of suffering? I think people think of you as probably yeah. walking through the deepest water. Mm. and. Uh, People probably don't know your personal life as, as well, but uh, whichever. Yeah, I, one, of the, one of the biggest mercies of God and, and one of the ways I really understood his goodness as, as, we, as the cancer was discovered and the prognosis was given really uh, took place long before the suffering got there. And that was that, that God had intervened in a pretty spectacular way early on to let me see his bigness. Um, and and I've, often, uh, I've often kind of try to get my head around how people manage and deal with suffering who don't, who lack that kind of robust view of who God is. And so when I got to the church, it was, it was we were very young. And so it, even now, here I am 10 years into pastoring the village and have done um, dozens and dozens of funerals. In fact, David and I were just talking that even in the last week, I did the funeral for a one-year-old and an eight-year-old. Wow. I mean, I just don't do funerals for 70-year-olds. I would love to do faithful 70 year old man yeah, right. that went home to be with the Lord. Everybody's and happy. and so what became apparent is that, that, that the church that God had asked me to shepherd um, had no real, mm. uh, no real kind of um, frame to, to hang suffering on uh, in, in a way that, that they understood God to be good and, and yet could do something with the reality that the world's broken and we see it all the time. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I just steadfastly tried to prepare them for suffering, which uh, you know, I, I don't know if maybe I should feel shame or uh, chuckle about it, but all the while God's getting me ready, and, mm -hmm. and I think I'm trying to get them ready. And so one of the ways, and I, I think one of the ways that really made my heart glad a, as I began to uh, walk through the chemo and radiation is that God had really prepared me yeah. as I had set out to prepare others. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't know, I mean, I, obviously people do, but I don't know how you rejoice in suffering without an understanding of the size and, and, and magnificence of God in, in it. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would you say it the same way? I, the bigness, you're talking about the bigness, the majesty, the sovereignty of God yeah. helps. It's not, not mainly problem, mainly help. Is that not only help, a necessary, like a high view of God, is, I think is the only thing that does sustain in the middle of suffering. It's the confidence that not only does he allow these things, but he even ordains these things for our good, that we have a loving Father who gives us what works together for our good. And, that, that's and better, trust in that. Better news than God didn't have anything to do with that. That's, that's horrible news, because if he didn't, then he's not in control, and, and he's, not, he's not able to ensure that this is going to work together for good. The fact that he is sovereign over it all is the rock. I mean, this, that sovereignty is the only foundation for praise, for confidence in the middle of pain. Well, it enabled me to rejoice. And, and I think that's where the ability to rejoice when I'm, when I'm going, man, I don't, I don't get to walk my daughter down the aisle. Hmm. I mean, I don't, I don't get to watch my son graduate from high school. I don't get, in fact, the jury's still out on a lot of mm. those things. And, and to be able to rejoice in that is because my, my understanding from the Word of God is, is that more than I need to just think right now, uh, I need to think what God has promised to me in the gospel and what glory has for me. And then if I'm thinking 10,000 years from now, then I can say with Paul, this is like momentary, <laughs> yeah. uh, right? If I'm not thinking, if all I'm thinking is I don't get to walk my daughter down the aisle, that's devastating. If, if I see that all things are made new, and as Lewis said, the sad things come untrue, yeah. if I'm thinking a billion years from now, then I can just join with Paul, go, you know what, me laying on the floor, vomiting, that's light and momentary. Mm. You know, mm. Me not getting to watch, you know, Nora and Audrey walk down the aisle to officiate their weddings, to see my son become a, a man. The only way you can say that's light and momentary is if you understand the bigness of God in re redeeming man unto himself by the yeah. power of the gospel and then seeing into glory. Mm -hmm. And then you can rejoice it. Then I can join Paul. I mean, I, I don't think until I walked I could join Paul. And until I got that, until I crossed the threshold from just kind of a theological idea to entering into, mm -hmm. this might be reality for me. So that, let me jump in right there. 
Walking through suffering ourselves enables us to experience things Paul has talked about, which until then, that we read about that. Yeah. But then here, it, the, the way I put it was, just pick out the death of my mother at 28 years old, get the phone call, tell Noelle she's dead, walk back to my bedroom, kneel down by the bed, cry for two hours, and experience for the first time mm -hmm. Sorrowful yet always rejoicing. Yeah. Mm. I mean, that phrase yeah. at that moment was so manifestly real, yeah. manifestly real. Because I'm, I'm crying. I'm just crying like I'd never cried before. Just mm. on and on, because it was sudden. She's 56 years old. She's not supposed to be gone. I've, my, my wife is pregnant. She'll never know this kid. She's gone, and all the while. My heart's leaping with yeah. thanksgiving. Yeah. She was a great mom. She yes. loved me. I had her for 28 yes. years. Yes. God has taken yes. care of her. And, and these emotions that were, in many people's minds, diametrically opposed mm -hmm. of, of sorrow and joy. So now for, for me to say to our church, we, we need to be a people who are sorrowful yet always rejoicing is not gobbledygook. No. Mm -hmm. And so one of the goodnesses of God, it seems, for our people as they walk through is they taste that. Mm -hmm. They taste it. Any, any other things they taste? What other things? Or where are we going to go? Well, I, I'll tell you, the, you, you quoted a, a text that just immediately popped the rest of the text into my head. One of the things I've tried to lay before our people are in, in that same line. He's perplexed but not driven to despair. Yeah. And so there is this element when I'm at Chase's funeral, one-year-old little boy went to take a nap, didn't wake up, that, that I can say, hey, it's okay to be perplexed here, but we're not perplexed to the point of despair. All right, we, yeah. we know there's a sovereign that we put our confidence in, and then that goes back to that big God theology that, and I think I've heard you say it before or do it, where you, you just kind of cover your mouth and raise your hand, yeah. that, that, that there's a part of me that's perplexed. I don't know how the death of a one-year-old brings you glory. I, I don't know. Hmm. I, I'm not going to figure it out. I can't answer that question, but what I can do is trust that, that you're sovereign and you're good regardless of what I can see in this little dew on the grass in the morning and, and I'm not going to be driven to despair despite the fact that I am allowed. I mean, even Paul said perplexed. This is perplexing, yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's not going to drive me to despair. And so I've always found that to be a great comfort in that text also. And there's no question that in that, and the way we, we've talked about it as we've studied through Ruth or Job or when I think about my own life, how God uses sorrowful tragedy to set the stage for surprising triumph. And it's not, I want to be careful in saying that because it's not that we're guaranteed, okay, a year from now things are gonna be better or two years from now things are gonna be better. We <coughs> do know we have an eternal weight of glory that is awaiting us and our present sufferings are not worth comparing with that glory. But at the same time, the Lord does delight in showing surprising triumph in the middle of sorrowful tragedy. When I think about my own personal journey and the uh, the journey my wife and I went on for five years of not able to have kids and really wrestling through that just a, a month after month wrestling with why do we have this desire in our heart? You're able to provide, you're not providing. We don't understand this, but the way the Lord has, has used that time in sanctifying us and then the triumph he's brought on the other side of that through adoption and other, other means, it's just, I look around my table right now and it's Ephesians 3, immeasurably more than all I could yeah. ever ask or imagine. I didn't even know to ask for the position <laughs> I'm in right now yeah. as a dad that I couldn't have even dreamed of seven years ago. And so, and I'm not saying everybody's yeah. story's gonna yeah. end up yeah. a certain way, but I, I am confident that sorrowful tragedy in this, in this life the Lord ordains it to set the stage for surprising triumph, whether in this life or in the life to come. Yeah. That's good. Amen. Thank you, guys.